So let's talk about the big, big theme in your book of psychological avoidance. And let's go straight to the definition that you use to explain this. Psychological avoidance is anything that we do that brings our emotional temperature down really quickly, but long-term gets us stuck. Think about this as a quick fix. Whatever it is, you're feeling anxious, you're feeling stressed, and you reach for a glass of wine. You don't respond to an email. You raise your voice to somebody. And in that moment, that reaction tends to make you feel better. The problem is long-term gets you stuck. So if we go back to my grandmother's example, had she not caught it, I probably would have developed social phobia, as you said. Right? She caught this early enough that my avoidance probably was three, four months I was living with her and she caught this and she forced me to approach and not avoid. But what I've seen now, 20 years as a clinical psychologist, if we don't catch that, then what happens? You develop social anxiety, right? If you don't catch it in your marriage, it leads to conflict at a minimal, if not divorce. If you don't catch at work, I had a great friend who called me a couple of weeks ago and said, I just got fired. I was like, what? Like, you haven't even told me that work was bad. And she's like, well, I didn't want to talk about it because if I talked about it, then you know, I was upset. So I just said it, that maybe I just would pretend it didn't happen. I was like, but you just got fired. She's like, well, I was miserable. So it's probably a good thing. But she avoided that reality so much right? That the consequence of that avoidance led to the worst outcome she expected, which eventually happened. Yes. And you're illustrating really the, the possible severity of it. Because I think when at first you could think, oh, it's quite light, you know, sure, I have that extra glass of wine or I'm feeling a bit stressed right now. So I'm going to, well, procrastinate. I'm sure all of us have done this. Like, oh, I'm going to do it later. I'll just clean instead. That's still productive. Gonna, <laughs> right? Yeah, but it's the point where we go, ah, yeah, I'm really self-sabotaging here and I'm not getting anywhere closer to where I want to be. I'm not achieving the success I am. I'm not having that fulfilling relationship. I'm feeling stuck. Yeah. And this is really important, Shana, because it does go from sort of a mild, you know, I'm procrastinating once a week and it's fine. Um, and I'm seeing actually really high function people that avoid and they sort of delegate their things so they can avoid. So Sometimes it doesn't interference enough and it's just, you know, once a week you may have a few too many glasses of wine. But my experience is that for most people, when they really start to engage in psychological avoidance, it robs them from the life they actually want, mm. right? And, and so it's not just that it caused a little problem here, but like the way somebody said to me when I hit that wall, a colleague of mine who I absolutely love. I was really upset and I was talking to her and she's trying to counsel me. And she says, okay, I just have one question for you. Are you showing up as your best self right now? And that was an easy answer. And the answer was no. And she says, then figure out what's getting in the way. Right? And I, for me at that point is I was avoiding my reality. I was avoiding that what I was doing no longer fit what I wanted to do. And that who was paying the price was just me. You know, my boss was happy because I was still writing grants. The academia was happy because I was still publishing papers. Outside of the world, everybody's going to give me M&Ms. I wasn't sleeping well. I wasn't happy on my body. I had to put on 50 pounds. I was playing the price. And that's what I see with psychological avoidance is there's this hidden price tag that we just sort of lie to ourselves. That's okay. But if we sort of get naked with ourselves, not so good. Exactly. And this is where the anxiety comes in, right? Like people who maybe don't even feel like I have generalized anxiety disorder. It's just, I feel anxious and not realizing that a lot of that is because of this very avoidance that you're describing. Absolutely. You know, anxiety, stress, burnout, those are words that we hear again and again, and they are debilitating. But anxiety is not what keeps us stuck. What keeps us stuck is what we do when we're anxious. If what we do is avoiding, then that's what keeps us stuck. Because I have anxiety myself. I had it this morning. I woke up. I was anxious. I told you the last 48 hours I've been stuck on fear. And then this morning, I did actually what you said. I went, okay, what is one thing I can do that I know I can accomplish in the next hour? And then I turned off everything on my computer and I focused on one thing only. And when he finished, I was feeling a little better. It's not that anxiety disappears but it's lesson. Yes, exactly. You know, it's funny. I have this post-it note. I didn't even realize this on my laptop because I'd realized that avoidance had come up big time for me. 
And part of that was in not have not giving myself fixed deadlines for when I want to achieve things by in my business mm-hmm. and constantly feeling like I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready. I'm not good enough. I need to learn more. All of that. All mm-hmm. the old stories. Oh yeah. So I had a little post-it note here. What are you avoiding doing? This is right here on my laptop just to remind me when, you know, I'm ready to give up. And it's like, no, I I wanted to pay more attention to my so-called escape routes. And maybe mm-hmm. we can go into this after when you say about identifying how we avoid. But I was like, okay, you plan and you research and you prepare rather than do. Mm-hmm. I pursue another big idea. I let myself get excited by something else and don't focus on the other thing I actually have to do. I'd have like an emotional breakdown. Oh, it's also overwhelming. No, can't do it. Or I find somebody else to help me in some way to be like, oh, what do you think I should do rather than trusting myself? So I literally have that as a post-it note to when those moments come up for me (laughs) to try and, yeah, get on track. Shannon, this is so good though, because I, I think we should pause here because you just highlighted all of the major routes that people take. Seriously? Right? <laughs> yeah, because see, and, and they're really clever. You know, people that are high function have really clever ways to avoid. And that's why it's hard to catch, right? Because instead of saying, oh, I can't do it, you just think, oh, maybe I can find somebody a little more qualified. They can teach me how to do it or give me strategy. Women do this a lot. Well, I like a little strategy. So maybe if somebody gave me a little strategy, I can execute. But if you put in life or death situation, you would execute, right? <laughs> oh, you're calling me out hard. You would execute. It's just that you, you're not in a life and death situation. So that avoidance takes over. And it's so subtle, right? I, I, and funny, I didn't talk about this in this book, and I'll talk about it in the next book I'm writing about transitions, this idea of subtle avoidance. When it's not bad enough, that the price tag is not high enough, but it's there, and it becomes this way of functioning in the world. And the way I hear, sorry to sort of poke at you a little bit, but what go I hear on, is- Go on, go for it. <laughs> poke at me. I'm ready. Well, I hear just a bunch of subtle avoidance. They're all with the underbelly of like, am I good enough? Can I do this? Yes. That is it. That is it. And the thing is, you know, you get to that point where you're like, oh, I'm so fed up because I've spoken about this so openly on the podcast. Like I've shared so deeply of how in my childhood I, you know, I had an absent father. I felt like I was getting recognition in school for achievements that that gave me the sense of praise and that sense of love that I think I was seeking so much. And it ended up creating a pattern you know, and it's hard to break that down and then to really get to the core of that wound that hurts. You wear so many masks, you put so many layers all around it to prevent yourself from feeling that overwhelming shame and that fear that's buried within, Mm -hmm. you know, and it really is a journey I find. But let's simplify that journey for you today, because I think it will help a lot of people that are listening to us because, you know, give me your four things that you do again. Okay. I research, plan, and prepare Mm -hmm. instead of taking action. Mm -hmm. I pursue another sparkly idea, Mm -hmm. something else rather than the thing at hand. I have emotional breakdowns, like overwhelm, Mm -hmm. just cut it, shut it all away and go Mm -hmm. away. Or I find somebody else to help me. Like you say, the strategy, find another expert, reads, all of that. And if the fear here is that you're not good enough, I'm putting words in your mouth, right? That like, in, in school, growing up, you weren't loved enough at home. And so therefore you got loved for the praise of school. And so to be good enough, you have to perform. Am I right? Yes. And so every time you engage in one of those things, what does your brain understand? So if you have a meltdown, what is it teaching your brain? That I'm not good enough, that That's I'm not capable. That's exactly yeah. it. And so those escape routes are only maintained because they reaffirm that belief. Oh, and so the brain yes. doesn't like when two things don't match. And so if the belief is I'm not capable, then every time you do something that's not capable, your brain goes, yep, yeah, not capable, no problem, still not capable. And it just maintains the belief. Ah, that is so good. That is so good. That's like an epiphany moment for me right there. Like not only going to the the core memories, the core beliefs, how that was all constructed in the first place, but the ways in which I and other people listening continue to reinforce that pattern through our behaviors. And it's it's biologically, the brain does this and, and it's like it makes a pretzel. 
right? And it basically wants to confirm what the narrative was because it's the path of least resistance your whole life. That's the highway in your brain. And so every time we engage in avoidance, what we do is we confirm that old belief. It's painful, by the way, right? Mm. But it's less painful than executing. Is it? In the short term, it is. In the long term, not so much. Yeah. And this is what brings us back to that like wall moment, right? Where you suddenly go, God, I'm just so fed up of getting in my own way or realizing like, yeah, I'm not moving anywhere fast. And by that, I'm also doing what you're saying, which is reinforcing that belief of not being good enough. See, I haven't actually made progress with this. So I'm still acting in that same way. Yeah. And so for you, the recipe, and the reason I wanted to simplify is the recipe is simple, actually. And no wonder you like the approach, not avoid. It's just one thing to execute. Say that you're going to execute that thing only for the next three weeks. And it doesn't matter what the shine object is, you close it off. It doesn't matter what it is. You just say, no shine object. No, I'm not going to hire anybody. This is what I'm going to execute. And I'm going to execute imperfectly. But in the next three weeks, and your brain's going to scream, hell, Mary, it's going to hate it. Then the meltdowns will increase momentarily, by the way, because once you take avoidance out, and that's why people don't fight avoidance, when you take it out, the brain goes, what are you doing? It's like the alcoholic that stops drinking, right? It's like, what are you doing? But over time, the brain goes, oh, there's no lion. And then we start to break the old pattern. 